It's not an understatement to say that most of us use computer-based items all day, every day. Our computers, our phones, smart TVs, smart watches, smart home type things. I could go on. And I think it's really cool, especially if I'm looking for a little more existential angst in my life than usual, to think about what's actually happening inside any of those machines while we use them. Now, I'm mostly a biology person. I'm not a computer scientist or electrical engineer, so I brought two people on board who know way more about this stuff than I do to help me understand it. This is Azine Davoudzade and Letitia Hubbard, both of whom are now educators and whose students recently won the Samsung Cell for Tomorrow 2020 grand prize this past year. So basically, we start with what we're looking at when we use our devices. What we interact with is called the graphical user interface, or the GUI, delicious, which is like the icons, the menus, the way things move around and look while we click them. And this is basically kind of like a layer of makeup worn by your computer's operating system, or OS. And that's the software that controls your computer's basic functions. The GUI is programmed to say, your mouse clicked this button, and this corresponds with this text that is part of the programming language. So all of this ridiculously complicated stuff that we ask our computers or our phones or our tablets to do seems simple when we ask it, because we're communicating with our OS through a GUI. But those actions, like clicks and opening applications, that makes our computer's OS tell our computer's hardware and other software what to do, usually through some kind of programming language. So the programming language is usually usually has elements of like real language, so like words that we can understand. The way that their brain, the computer's brain, thinks is in ones and zeros. And the way our brain thinks is more abstract thinking. And in order to bridge these two communication barriers, because we speak two different languages, that's where programming languages were created in order for us to be able to communicate with computers so that they can translate our words in the compiler into ones and zeros, essentially. And so the compiler is just able to take the real language and turn it into zeros and ones that the computer can use um, in terms of, of programming the actual components inside of the computer. And once our instructions are translated into that binary code that our computer can understand, our computer's motherboard then knows what signals to send electrically to complete the task we're asking of it. Ones and zeros are nice because it's like a switch, and so it turns on and off. And switches are like a basic electrical component. And so it's very easy to make something like a transistor act like a switch. And so you can actually code the data as zeros and ones, which corresponds to the switches inside of the computer. So the computer is switching components on and off to correlate to the data that corresponds to the instructions uh, that you are trying to give the computer. Isn't it bonkers that all of this can be executed based on tiny little pulses of electricity? And what blows my mind even more is that everything our computers do is basically just a pattern of two options. Yes or no, on or off, zero or one. It's pretty nuts. Okay, so the basics of computing are already really cool, but there are even more complicated things we can do with computers, like artificial intelligence. AI is sort of an umbrella term for any kind of simulation of human intelligence or human-esque thinking patterns. I think a lot of people, when they hear the words AI, immediately think of like a humanoid robot that can think for itself and is totally independent. But AI is actually a lot more than that because it's also things like machine learning and deep learning. I actually have a whole video you can watch here about what machine learning is if you want more detail, but essentially, machine learning and deep learning are two different but very similar ways of getting a computer algorithm to teach itself how to do what you want it to do. Essentially, what we want to do is be able to, we want a, an algorithm that can adapt to changes in data without having to have input from a human being. With machine learning, we are providing an algorithm with a specific set of data that has been labeled. So like, let's say the example between apples and oranges, we want to be able to distinguish between apples and oranges. So we would say this is labeled as an orange, this is labeled as an apple, and then the actual algorithm can learn the characteristics of what makes something an orange or what makes something an apple. For example, if you're trying to teach a computer what a tree is, you would front load it with hundreds of pictures of trees and it will try to identify what makes a tree a tree. 
So the more data you give it, the more precise the understanding of what a tree is. And so therefore the machine learning program will take all that data and evaluate it into its learning. And with the deep learning, you don't necessarily have to give it structured data. So it can, it has these layers of algorithms that were kind of like a, a mini brain, right? And so all of these different layers can extract patterns and information from the data or the images that you give it. And from this data, it's learning how to interpret the images. And so it's a step further because you don't have to tell it up front which is the orange and which is the apple. Letitia's Solve for Tomorrow team, for example, used a deep learning algorithm to create an app that can help a user determine what kind of material an object is made of, and the app helps a user determine what bin that object should go in to either be recycled or thrown away. When you break it down, that is actually an incredibly complicated task that involves image detection, characteristic labeling and sorting, and communicating back to the user what the decision is on what the object is and what you should do with it. And keep in mind, that's not a human making any of those decisions, it's the algorithm, which is just mind-boggling. And these guys are in high school. I don't know what I was doing in high school, but it was definitely not this. For our team, for the Samsung Solve for Tomorrow project, we developed a low cost, lightweight fire detection sensor to be used in rural areas. What we did was we used AI to determine a threshold on our device. Once that threshold was reached, it would notify the fire department. Now the learning part of it is that this threshold could vary based on multiple factors such as humidity, wind speed, um, heat, wind direction. And so all these factors need to be taken into account. And by feeding our device many data points, it would be able to hopefully accurately predict outcomes and therefore prevent future fire outbreaks. And I think we take a lot of stuff like this in our day-to-day -day lives for granted. Email services, for example, now offer predictive text where they fill in what they think you were probably going to say next. And traffic predictions in any kind of Maps app have definitely saved my butt when trying to get places on time. Customer support chatbots, search engine result customization, facial recognition, or the people you may know feature on social media apps, targeted advertising, which we're all familiar with. All of these are examples of AI that many of us encounter every day. And one that's become extra popular recently are personal assistants like Bixby, Alexa, Google Home. And these are especially complicated because they involve the machine having to process human language. And I think this kind of AI, which is called natural language processing or NLP, is a really cool one to focus in on because it's kind of the perfect example of where computers and humanity intertwine. Because you have to be able to take the sound, translate it to maybe some type of text, and then you have to be able to figure out the nuances of the text. Did the person really mean what they say what they meant or maybe were they being sarcastic? And, and then how do you respond? Like what is the appropriate response to the language? So one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, if developers don't include all of those languages and the mixed and the nuances, then they're, they'll miss large parts of those conversations. Um, and that comes with biases or creating it where there's a status quo of all, you know, it's not a very diverse area or maybe the development team is not as diverse. I think we like to think of things like programming languages or computers, artificial intelligence, all of that as really separate from our humanness. The machine version is cold and detached and impartial and unbiased, and it's based on mathematics and statistics and probabilities. And I think most of our pop culture reinforces this idea and trains us to think about computers and computer related stuff in that way. But that's kind of a myth because all of the ways that we use computers, the ways we talk to computers, the ways we end up using what computers let us do, all of this has been shaped and influenced by the humans that built them. And whether we like to admit it or not, we build our own biases into computer code and AI and algorithms. So if we're not careful, all of these can perpetuate our existing social inequities. You can only have a strong as algorithm as your data set. And we learned this over and over again with our project. If you only have 10 images to pick from, then those 10 images will determine your final output. And so if you have 
an image detection system and it only consists of people of a certain color or a certain gender or a certain race or ethnicity, then your program will be skewed. And even though with deep learning, your program is constantly learning and it can adjust, especially if there are mistakes, it can only be as robust as the data that you're putting into it. And so the only way you get diverse programming and diverse input into a system is if you have diverse people working on the problem. But then even starting back in the beginning, like high school age, what I teach or even elementary age, putting these systems in place of, you know, promoting diversity. I mean, I really would love to say that Samsung Solve for Tomorrow inspired a diverse team of my own students to get together. And we all had different unique talents to be able to contribute. And I think just starting even earlier, you know, to build those connections and the world would be a lot more tolerant when they get older and they'll already want to join those teams when they're, you know, of age to work in the tech industry. So I, for one, am glad we have people like Letitia and Azeen in the classroom, helping to shape the next generation of computer scientists and software engineers, because at the end of the day, the people behind it all is what matters most. Thank you so much to Samsung Solve for Tomorrow for sponsoring this video. If you want to learn more about the program or get your school involved in the competition, you can find them at Solve for Tomorrow on Facebook and Instagram, or you can learn more at samsung.com solve. Special thanks again to Azine and Leticia for being part of this video. And if you guys have questions for them or for me, leave them down in the comments below and we'll see if we can get to them. Subscribe to this channel for more videos like this. And as always, thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you want to see next time and I'll catch you in the next one.